Earlier today, Trent Horn, the Roman Catholic apologist on YouTube, uploaded a new video trying to refute some arguments that Protestants often make in defense of sola scriptura. And in his video, Trent actually played a clip from one of my videos defending sola scriptura, and so I thought I'd better offer a response. So here we go. First of all, at the very beginning of the video, Trent says that for Protestants, although we do believe that there are other spiritual authorities, such as tradition, such as the writings of the church fathers or the reformers, those authorities are always subordinate to scripture. That's correct. But then Trent says, in fact, they're always subordinate to the individual Protestant's own personal interpretation of scripture because the individual Protestant then gets to decide which tradition agrees with their view of scripture. My main response to this is that everyone does this. Everyone does this. In fact, Trent Horn does this in his very video where he's trying to prove that his view of how to interpret 2 Timothy 3.16 is in accordance with Roman Catholic tradition. And even when it comes to the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church, because it's not often in entirely clear what it actually is saying, so for instance, is the death penalty something that's allowed or not? Is it a moral good or is it a moral evil? We see Roman Catholics pick and choose which Roman Catholic traditions they're going to follow, which ones are more important than others and so on and so forth. So in the contradictions between Vatican I and Vatican II or Vatican II and the Council of Trent, even then the individual Roman Catholic is going to use their own personal judgment, their own personal interpretation to decide what the true teaching is. So yes, it is true that to a degree, a Protestant will have scripture be number one and that scripture will to a certain degree, be their own personal interpretation of scripture, because it's just a fact of life, epistemologically speaking, that everything we read, everything that we perceive, everything we hear can only be understood from our subjective point of view. The thing in and of itself cannot be known. It can only be known from our perspective. That's just the reality of it. It's the same with anything. It's the same with the Roman Catholic magisterium. You can only read it. You can only interpret it from your subjective viewpoint. But yes, everything should be subordinate to scripture. We can have other authorities, but scripture has to be number one. The reason for that is because scripture needs to be the starting point or the first principle of our faith. It needs to be the, the sort of foundation stone and everything else from then has to be in agreement with scripture, otherwise it can't be true. This is what we mean by rule of faith. Scripture is what determines whether something is true or false, right or wrong. It's the very basis for truth itself. Now, the reason scripture needs to be the first principle of our faith is because ultimately our faith is in God, God, the Holy Trinity, as revealed through Jesus Christ, as revealed in scripture. Scripture is God's divine revelation. Everything that we know about Jesus just about is from the Gospels. Everything that we know about what God did in the Old Testament is told to us in the Old Testament. So if God is who our faith is ultimately grounded in, and if we know who God is through the Scriptures, the Scriptures need to be the first principle of our faith, the starting point of our faith. Otherwise, you have to say that the church is the first principle of your faith. So ultimately, you believe in God as revealed by the church. But that can't be the case because even scripture says that the church is founded on the prophets and the apostles. But also it just begs the question, who is the church? Which church reveals God? Now, I would argue that even someone like Trent Horn actually has this epistemology where his first principle is scripture. The reason why is imagine if, and of course, someone like Trent Horn would say that such a thing could never happen. But let's just say hypothetically it did. What if the Roman Catholic Church met in a council and declared all 13 of Paul's letters to be heretical, to be false, that they're going to cut them out of the canon of Scripture? And also, while we're at it, we'll cut out the Pentateuch and we'll cut out the Gospel of John. Well, every true Christian who's a Roman Catholic would immediately know that that council is false, that it's a, it's a heretical council. It cannot be believed. It cannot be assented to. We just, we just sort of, we know that because Scripture's number one. And most people I know who've converted to Roman Catholicism from Protestantism did so, I think they did so incorrectly, of course, but they did so 
because they thought the Roman Catholic Church agreed with Scripture the most. People are always, and this is a good thing that they're doing this, judging what's true, judging what's false based on the Word of God. They're looking at the Roman Catholic Church's teachings, they're looking at Scripture, and they're seeing if there is a harmony there. If they think there is a harmony, they'll believe in the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because Scripture is the first principle of their faith, the ground of their truth, the ground of truth itself. And that's why everything else has to be subordinate to it, because it's the starting point. Now, Trent Horn accuses Protestants of being circular, of having circular reasoning. I'd accuse him of the same thing, and I'd also admit that to a certain degree, whenever you sort of take ev everyone's epistemology and you really dissect it, there's always going to be a little bit of circular reasoning there. But I'd say the same thing for Trent Horn. He's saying the Roman Catholic Church is true because of the Bible, but the Bible's true because the Roman Catholic Church says it's true. Right? He's obviously looking at Scripture, looking at the church and saying, this is the church that I find in the New Testament. Okay, so, he, so the Bible proves the church. But then he's going to make arguments about how you can't know what Scripture is without the church. And it's just going to keep going round and round and round. We see this sort of circular reasoning all the time. Another example is with ecumenical councils. Roman Catholics won't make this argument as much, but Eastern Orthodox Christians will. They'll say an ecumenical council is infallible. Because whenever the entire church is in agreement in a council, it's infallible. Well, that just begs the question, who the church is? So, for instance, why is the council of Ephesus an infallible council? Well, because I'll say, oh, because it represents the entire universal church. But hold on a minute, the Oriental Orthodox weren't there. They, they don't recognize that council. And then they'll say, oh, that's because they're not part of the church. Well, why aren't they part of the church? Oh, because they didn't agree with the Council of Ephesus. So it's just complete circular reasoning. The church defines who the church is. The church says who the church is. It just keeps, and all you have to do is keep asking, who is the church? Who is the church? Who is the church? If they say the church is who, the new, who is in agreement of the New Testament, we see with, you know, all these little things about what the church does and who the church is, you know, it's founded on the on St. Peter, etc. And that points to the church. Okay, so scripture is defining who the church is. So scripture is your first principle. So everything is subordinate to scripture. If the church defines who the church is, then you can't have any certainty and it just keeps going round and round and round. Now, the point that Trent Horn makes in his video is that 2 Timothy 3.16, which is a classic text Protestants always bring up that says that all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for reproof, etc. Trent Horn is saying that that verse doesn't actually prove sola scriptura. The reason he thinks that is because he goes into a very technical breakdown of the verse of what it says in Greek and how it should really be translated. Now, I'm actually not convinced by the arguments that Trent makes in this video, but I also don't wanna go into all these technical details. I'm just gonna say this, even if Trent was true about this verse, it doesn't change anything. The only thing it really changes is that Protestants shouldn't use this verse as much in apologetics. Because even if you take this verse out of the Bible, even if you say that Protestants can't use this verse to defend sola scriptura, we still have more than enough from the Bible to prove our point. So the main passage, I think, in Scripture for Sola Scriptura is Matthew 15, verse 3 to 9, which I read out to you. Jesus answered the Pharisees, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me of their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And verse 3, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? This passage shows from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ himself that there is a big, big, big difference between the word of God and the teachings of men. And we see throughout the scriptures that Jesus actually respects the teachings of the Pharisees. He says, don't do what they do, but do what they say. And yet he's saying, you cannot have your traditions make void the word of God and your human traditions cannot be taught as doctrines. Only the word of God can be doctrines. That's the that's pretty clear 
in that passage. So yes, the teachings of the Pharisees have authority, as Jesus says, do what they say, but they don't have infallible authority and everything has to be subordinate to the word of God. If something they teach contradicts the word of God, that means it's false because the word of God is the first principle of our faith, what judges everything else. Now, also in the video, Trent Horn says that in the early church, many writings that weren't scripture were, were said to be inspired of God. And then he uses that to prove that it wasn't the case that in the early church, they only thought that scripture was inspired. And sure, I would I would also agree that there are other things that are inspired by God. I would just say they're not infallibly inspired by God, which we'll get to in just a moment. But just to give you an example, I've actually just finished writing a lengthy essay about what the Anglican divines thought about the Apocrypha. And as I was researching that, I was reading about John Whitgift, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, a Protestant who believed in Sola Scriptura. But I have many quotes from Whitgift where he says that the Book of Homilies, which were written in his lifetime by men like Thomas Cranmer, he says that they're inspired by God. And the point is, he can say that because he's not saying they're infallibly inspired by God. He's not saying the Book of Homilies are the word of God that thus saith the Lord when you read the homilies. But he is saying that the homilies are guided by the Holy Spirit in, in some sense. People have even um, said this of me sometimes. If I give a really good sermon, they might come up to me and say, wow, I, I, I felt God speaking to me through you. Or I, I felt that your, your sermon was a little bit inspired. Pe people can use that language. Of course, we would agree that some things are inspired. Some books by church fathers or even reformers, we read and we say this has such an amazing quality. God clearly had a hand in it. That's different to what we're saying about Scripture. First of all, Scripture contains a witness about itself that all of God's elect can identify. So Jesus says, my sheep know my voice in John 10, 27 to 28. And St. Peter in John 6 says to Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. Those who have the Spirit of God within them are able to read the Scriptures and identify that that is God's Word because they know their shepherd's voice. We cannot say the same thing of other writings. So, yes, some people might think that a good preacher is a little bit inspired by God, but that preacher could never claim, if you don't recognize God's voice and what I'm saying, you're not a Christian. You can't say that because only Scripture has that witness about itself. Because only scripture is the direct voice of the shepherd. The sheep know my voice. Scripture is the words, the direct words of the shepherd. Nothing else is like that. A church father or a reformer might have the spirit of God inspiring them in some sense, but they can't say after they've written something, thus saith the Lord, as we see repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in many places, such as Mark 12, 36, Acts 1, 16, Acts 28, 25, Hebrews 3, 17, it quotes the Old Testament and says, the Holy Spirit said, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking through David said, you, you can't say that of a church father's book or a reformer's book. You, you might say, wow, the Holy Spirit inspired this in some sense, but you can't say the Holy Spirit said, speaking through St. Basil or something. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, Peter says, Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is a sort of direct inspiration that only Scripture has. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. You know, the, the writers of Scripture are almost like God's sort of secretaries. The Holy Spirit is dictating to them his word. We're not going to say the same thing of anything else. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says that his words are not the word of men, but are the word of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, Paul says, The things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. Now, what's important there is that in 1 Corinthians 14, where it's talking about how women must be silent in church, by the way, for those watching this who might be egalitarian, nowhere else in Scripture does it say clearly that women must be silent in church. So, so we know that Jesus, we don't have any recordings of Jesus having said that. This is, this is Paul saying it, and he's saying what I'm writing to you is a command of the Lord. Can anyone else in this world 
write something that isn't found, you know, in the in, fruit from the mouth of Jesus or in the Old Testament, and then say, what I'm saying to you is a command of the Lord. If they said that, we'd say, you know, you're a cult leader, you're a heretic. But Paul can say it because he's directly inspired by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus is speaking through Paul as his mouthpiece. Only Scripture can have this quality. St. Athanasius wrote on the Incarnation, or Irenaeus wrote against heresies, incredible books that I do believe are inspired by God in some sense. But you, but Athanasius can't give you a teaching that's not found in Scripture and say, what I'm writing to you is a command of the Lord. That's blasphemy. But Scripture can say that because Scripture is directly inspired by God in a way that no other writing is. In John 6.63, the words of Scripture are called spirit and life. In Hebrews 4.12, they're called living and active. In 1 Peter 1.23, living and abiding. They have the power to give you rebirth. In John 17.17, 17, they are the words of truth that sanctify you. Right? Nothing else has this supernatural quality to it. And so my point is there's a difference between generic inspiration, like a good sermon or a good book can be inspired by God in some sense, or even a good piece of music, right? You, you hear some of the symphonies of Bach and Mozart and Beethoven, and you think this is inspired by God. There's something supernatural about this. Or even a piece of architecture, just to throw Roman Catholics a bone, you, you look at St. Peter's in Rome and you think, my goodness, I think the hand of God was in this somehow, that this is inspired. There's something supernatural going on here, okay? So there's, there's inspiration generically, but there's a difference between inspiration and God directly speaking through Scripture. Reading Scripture and being able to say, thus saith the Lord. These are the direct words of God. These, these are the commandments of the Lord. Only Scripture can have that. And that's why everything else has to be subordinate to Scripture. Because with Scripture, we have the certainty that this is God's commandment to you. This is God's word. This is the truth. Everything else has to be judged by that truth. If the church taught something or said something that was blatantly contradictory to scripture, just just blatantly, they just said, you know, Jesus never rose from the dead or something. Okay, well that's wrong. Because that's not what scripture says. And and it's because of that that we that we believe in sola scriptura because we say scripture never tells us that anything else is directly inspired by God like scripture is. And then lastly, just to talk about inerrancy, the inerrancy of Scripture is another reason why we believe in sola scriptura, because only Scripture is inerrant. Something else might be inspired by God, but not inerrant. I, I don't think I've ever read a book other than Scripture, a theological book at least. I mean, you could read like a maths textbook, you know, where everything there is correct. But a theological work that didn't have a single mistake or a single thing that maybe that's you could have said that a bit better or something. Only scripture is inerrant, and that's why scripture is the ground of truth. That's why it, it it's it's what judges the truth of everything else. Now Trent Horn says that he doesn't think that you can prove inerrancy from the Bible. He believes in inerrancy because the church teaches that. That was quite troubling to me because I think he's undermining scripture a bit there, and he's exalting the church way more than he should be. But in any case, I think the Bible does affirm that it is of itself inerrant. So in John 10, 35, Jesus, our Lord, says, Scripture cannot be broken. In Hebrews 6, 18, in Titus 1, 2, it says that it is impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for what he said in his word to turn out to be false. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says the law of the Lord is perfect. And then throughout the New Testament, we see that the it, whenever the Old Testament says something will happen, it has to be fulfilled. We see that, for instance, in Acts 1, 16, Luke 18, 31. The scriptures have to be fulfilled. In Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6, it says every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So in summary, it's because scripture is God's own direct word, is inerrant, and testifies of itself that it is God's word, that it is the infallible rule of faith. It's because of those three qualities. It's God's direct word. It's thus saith the Lord, which nothing else can be. It's inerrant and only it is inerrant. And three, it has this testimony of itself where the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. Other texts might be inspired, but they're not the direct words of God. Other texts might be inspired, but they're not inerrant. 
other texts might be inspired, but you can't say that the sheep will automatically recognize the voice of their shepherd in that source. And it's because of those three unique qualities that I believe in Sola Scriptura. Because I believe that there is no other source that I could say, me being a, sh a sheep, I inherently recognize the voice of the shepherd through this. This is the direct word of God. This is the commandment of the Lord. This is inerrant. Since I can't think of anything else in this world that I could say that about except for scripture, scripture will be my sole infallible rule of faith that will govern the truth of everything else. Now, Trent Horn doesn't believe in that, but I do still think that actually he still will have scripture sort of be his number one. It'll be, it'll be at the top in the hierarchy of everything. I might be wrong about that. I'd love to hear his thoughts on it. But I, I, I would find it very strange if, if that wasn't the case. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful to you. This is a, a very important discussion to have, so I'm happy to keep having it. Uh, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, comment about what you think of it, and God bless you.